Joining us now is Ted May, President and CEO of Anderson Sterilizers, and this is the Expert Series Conference. And Ted, I'm really happy to have you on for this interview and to talk a little bit more about gas sterilization. Uh, you and I know each other pretty well. Uh, you're featured in not only the Expert Series, but also in our very first episode of Beyond the Tour, which was a great deal of fun and us not only myself, but the entire team at Beyond Clean really enjoyed visiting uh, your facilities. And I do want to just put a shout out there. Uh, go to our YouTube channel if you don't know what I'm talking about and watch this spectacular episode highlighting the culture there at Anderson uh, Sterilizer. So, Ted, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and uh, for being a contributor to the Expert Series, which really provides a wealth of knowledge to the industry. Justin, thank you very much. Uh, number one, it's, it's a real pleasure to continue this conversation that has now been going on for a couple of years. And, you know, particularly in this environment where uh, a lot of the national conferences have been canceled, a lot of the, the national meetings have been canceled, uh, what you're providing here in terms of a, a long form for really detailed discussions, I think it's particularly valuable right now. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, it's our pleasure and we can't do it without partners uh, like yourself to be able to provide subject matter expertise in a lot of areas. And I, and I would say, you know, when it comes to gas sterilization, um, you've been kind of number one on our list every time we've had that conversation or we've done an interview. I feel like we've had most of it with you, and uh, there's good reason for that. Um, you're passionate about gas sterilization. You're extremely knowledgeable. You're very involved at multiple levels throughout the entire industry, not just at your own company. And, you know, I kind of want to take a step back and maybe get you to talk more about that. Like, what really drew you to gas sterilization and drove your passion for this industry? Justin, that's a, it's a great question. And I think the simple answer is the same for most of your listeners and people who get into the healthcare profession. Uh, we do it because it's meaningful work. And, you know, it's not always fun, it's not always easy, but at the end of the day, it, it does have a lot of meaning. And, you know, I'll, I'll turn this around a little bit. When you and I met, you and Hank had started Beyond Clean you had a, a fairly obscure podcast. And in our first conversations, I remember being very impressed with your sense of mission and with the, the goals that you had to try and bring education and knowledge to this field. And, you know, I thought at the time, you know, this is, this is great what they're doing, but, you know, is it, is it really going to take off? Is there going to be an audience for this? Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, Imagine that within a couple of years, infection control would become an international obsession. I mean, it's amazing, you know, what has happened with the, you know, the COVID environment and whatnot, how, you know, suddenly everybody is thinking about this infection control topic. So, you know, again, I, I come back to this idea that this work has great meaning and it has particular meaning today. For me, I joined Anderson uh, about 23 years ago, and I joined this company uh, in part because it has a very unique culture. The company was founded by scientists. It's run by, you know, three medical doctors. We've got a group of PhDs here, and it's always been driven by science. It's always been driven by innovation. <clears throat> the company is not run by MBAs. And so it's had this, this kind of, you know, very unusual culture there. And um, I came in and was very impressed by the emphasis on science, by the integrity of the founders and this focus that they've always had. And part of my personal journey with Anderson was uh, realizing early on that the regulatory side of things was very important, and I had a couple of people that I trusted in the industry sit me down and, and frankly, dress me down 
about the fact that Anderson was not involved in a lot of the national committees. And they said, you know, you, you guys, you guys got to get involved here. And I had grown up in Washington, D.C. I was comfortable with, with, you know, the Washington environment. And so nobody else wanted to do it. It was like, oh, you know, go up to D.C. You know, not, not, nothing good happens there. <laughs> and so I kind of got involved with regulatory, again, because nobody else in the company wanted to do it. And you start attending the regulatory meetings at Amy and elsewhere, and you've got these, these long conversations of literally what, is, what does a particular word mean? Where is a comma going to be placed? And the scientists at Anderson had no, had no patience for this. And over the years, you know, you sit through a lot of these boring discussions, but you, you also get to listen to the debates. You also get to listen to a lot of the latest research you know, you get to hear what's going on behind the scenes. And, you know, there's, in the Broadway musical Hamilton, there's a, a wonderful scene where the young Alexander Hamilton, who's ambitious, you know, talks about the fact that he wants to be in the room where it happened. And to a certain extent, the, the regulatory forum is like that. You know, you get to listen to the debate and over time, you get to participate in the debate. And I think this is, it's critically important to understand, you know, what's happening in our industry and the things that are driving our industry. So, you know, that's, that's really what has um, been most gratifying to me is, you know, to really play a part in this over the years. I've, I've had the, uh, the great opportunity to participate not only in uh, national committees, but international sterilization forums. I've been on a number of FDA panels. During the anthrax attacks, you know, I was part of a, a White House committee looking at the response to, you know, bioweapons. And it's, it's really been fascinating to um, be part of that discussion, you know, and to play a, to play a small part, but really to, to get a to get a look behind the scenes, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's interesting because we obviously have a lot of our conversations that are very tailored and specific to healthcare. But I can see once you get involved, um, that it's really a much broader scope and not just US based, but as you said, internationally. And when we say gas sterilization, what does that mean in terms of the healthcare context? Just kind of bringing that back to healthcare. And I know sometimes when we say gas sterilization, it can mean a lot of different things because there's various modalities. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, that's, um, it's a great place to start, you know, sort of laying out the, uh, the conversation. And historically, when you talk about gas sterilization, you're talking about ethylene oxide, you're talking about formaldehyde, you're talking about ozone, and maybe chlorine dioxide. I mean, these are the true gas sterilization methods. Uh, formaldehyde is not used in this country. Uh, ozone is, you know, something of a niche technology. Chlorine dioxide is used for the sterilization of spaces, you know, rooms, that type of thing. So in the healthcare context, ethylene oxide is really the player in gas sterilization. Now, it's important to start with this because recently some of the manufacturers of hydrogen uh, peroxide systems have begun to describe their systems as, as gas sterilization also. And uh, hydrogen peroxide is typically considered a liquid chemical. It has a very high boiling point. It's over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And so to create uh, a hydrogen peroxide vapor, or you know, what they call a gas, you've got to pull a very deep vacuum. And so while it's called a gas sterilization process, I think that ethylene oxide is the, uh, is the only true gas sterilization method in the healthcare setting. And for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to be talking about ethylene oxide to eliminate any confusion there. One of the things that always comes up, 
I would say, uh, in discussions with frontline technicians and managers, a lot of the time there we've got different instructions for use, right? And so, you know, not necessarily going down that road of validation, but when a device comes to market, it's got instructions for use, but then there's already equipment that's in the facility that has instructions for use about how to use that equipment to either high level disinfect or sterilize the equipment. And so it's almost like you've got two masters in that discussion that the department has to, to navigate a little bit. And so I wanted to ask you just because you described all that experience and sort of the background of this conversation, like what's happening behind the scenes when all of this uh, device manufacturing is happening, the research and development, you're going through the 510K process and not just for the sterilization equipment, but also for the device itself. Is there a conversation going on between the device manufacturer and the manufacturer of the equipment that reprocesses and sterilizes or disinfects the equipment? Justin, I've, I've always appreciated the fact that you're, you don't hesitate to open cans of worms. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, <clears throat> this is a, uh, a complicated topic because as you say, once a device manufacturer has gone through the FDA review process, and they have clearance for device, the IFUs are to a certain extent set in stone. And if you've had a device cleared, say 10 years ago, you really don't want to go back and change those IFUs because that will frequently trigger an entirely new FDA submission. And nobody wants to do that. Uh, FDA's requirements and expectations tend to evolve and increase over time. So if you've got a clearance, you know, you want to sit, you know, sit tight. Uh, and so manufacturers will oftentimes issue, you know, guidance outside of the IFUs or supplemental guidance. Um, it's a little different when you're talking about new devices. And increasingly, we're working with a lot of medical device startups, uh, companies with innovative technologies that do come to us early in the process. And they want to see, number one, is the device compatible with ethylene oxide? How effectively can it be sterilized? You know, we wish that more companies were doing that. And, you know, at the regulatory meetings, there's a, a regular parade of you know, sterilization manufacturers going up to the, the device manufacturers saying, you know, please, could you, you know, talk to us earlier in the process? And uh, I suspect there's going to remain a, a happy tension there for the time being. You have to think that it is beneficial to the device manufacturer to do that because once it gets out into the market, especially from the sterile processing perspective, having all of that vetted and being in alignment as you went through the 510K process, it just gives you more options and it gives you more consistency when you deliver the product. So I think I'm hearing you loud and clear. You're telling us that that's, that would be a best practice. And from your perspective, you know, the equipment manufacturers for reprocessing and sterilizing that are trying to be as proactive as possible to engage uh, the device manufacturers in that process early on and to encourage that. that that's right. That's a good summary. And you know, we're, we're talking to a lot of infection control professionals here. One of the uh, points of contention, and I, I know you've seen this, is that device manufacturers, endoscope manufacturers, increasingly are coming up with IFUs that are so complicated and so lengthy that clinicians are saying, look, this, this just is not practical. You know, the, the IFUs are going on to, you know, 100 pages and, you know, cleaning, cleaning requirements are so lengthy that, you know, they're saying we, you know, we can't do this. And so I think that there will continue to be uh, a conversation and a somewhat contentious conversation between device manufacturers whose instructions for reprocessing become more and more complicated to protect them versus the uh, 
central sterile professionals who are under a lot of time pressure, as you well know, and may not be able to perform you know, the lengthy steps that are being uh, suggested for them. And there's, there's not a, a happy answer to that right now. Yeah, and with a greater degree of variability, um, it does make it, I think, more difficult to remember the nuances from one device to another. So we all know that with standardization comes efficiency. And you mentioned being on the AMI committees, <clears throat> and I know they have a standard kind of format for writing up those instructions for you. So it does sound like there's good work that's being done to try to continue to move the industry in that direction. So. Um, this is the Expert Series Conference, and I do want to point out one of your recent articles on the Expert Series where you talked about gas efficiency. And so uh, without kind of telling everybody what the article was about, um, I'd like you to tell us more and introduce the audience to that concept if they didn't read your article and also really clarify why this concept of gas efficiency is and should be very important to sterile processing professionals? That's a great question. And uh, it really goes back to some misconceptions about ethylene oxide. And by misconceptions, I mean that the people that are running SPDs right now, the infection control professionals, uh, think they know about ethylene oxide. They think they, they understand ethylene oxide sterilization, and, and they do, uh, but a lot of the images that they have of ethylene oxide sterilizers were created, you know, back in the 90s and the early 2000s. You know, the large chamber systems running off of large tanks, and these systems had some well-known problems, and many facilities have gotten rid of ethylene oxide because of the very legitimate problems with these, you know, large tank-based systems. And so a lot of the objections to ethylene oxide regard a system and a process that doesn't exist anymore. You know, those systems are all off the market. Hospitals are not using them. And ethylene oxide technology has advanced, you know, very significantly. Um, we like to talk about uh, you know, ethylene oxide in, compare it to cars. And so, Justin, if, if you came to me and you said, you know, I'm, I'm anti-car. I'm anti-car because, you know what, 57 Chevys, they were, uh, they were not safe. You know, didn't have airbags, no ABS. You know, for God's sake, they didn't have seat belts. And the 57 Chevy, it's, it's dirty. It didn't have catalytic converters. It's polluting to the environment. And it only got 10 miles to the gallon. I, I, don't, I don't like cars. It's a, it's a bad technology. Well, if, if somebody came to you and tried to make that argument, you would politely point out that, um, uh, sir, uh, nobody's selling 57 Chevys anymore. <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about the modern hybrid. You know, let's talk about hybrid technology, 50 miles to the gallon, you know, modern crash tech, crash test technology. Uh, you know, it would be a very different conversation. And that's the point we're trying to make with ethylene oxide is that uh, ethylene oxide has advanced dramatically. And the modern 21st century systems are just night and day different from the ones that people think of and the ones that they may have been using earlier in their career. You know, we're using uh, simply grams of ethylene oxide per cycle, where the old systems oftentimes used pounds of ethylene oxide. Um, our systems have got emissions control equipment that release effectively nothing into the environment. And so the comparison with a modern hybrid, I think, is apt. And that's why we focus on efficiency, because it makes the system safer and it makes it much more environmentally friendly. And this is what people have to understand, that this has not been a, a static technology. It's been developed quite, you know, quite uh, consistently. And I would take this a step further, if I may. Uh, 
you know, the, the hydrogen peroxide systems that most hospitals are using now were developed in the 1980s. They were cleared by FDA in the 90s. This is now 30-year-old technology. The latest Anderson systems, the latest ethylene oxide systems were cleared by FDA two years ago. You know, you tell me which is the newer technology, which is the, you know, the 21st century method. And that's, you know, again, that's why we try and focus on efficiency to get people to reconsider what they, you know, they think they know about ethylene oxide. Yeah, I really love that car analogy. And the reason I say that is because in addition to, to how you described it, you know, a vehicle gets you to your destination and with newer models and newer technology, you can get to that destination in a more efficient way, in a more environmentally friendly way. And I can, I've heard car analogies before, but this one is probably the most appropriate and really describing um, or illustrating, I guess is a better way, uh, w the concept that you're trying to get across around this technology. And when we talk about that destination, one of the things, and you mentioned this already, that even outside of healthcare, just the awareness, right, of infection control has just risen to whole new levels. Things people never understood are starting to creep into our daily lives and our conversations on an ongoing basis. And a lot of education just in our society has been required as a result of that. But one of the hottest topics was superbugs and outbreaks. And I'd venture a guess to say that, at least in healthcare, that was one of the hottest topics prior to the pandemic. And so I wondered if you could tell us, you know, as it relates to superbugs and outbreaks, uh, where does gas sterilization play a part? Wow, that's um, that's really <laughs> something we could do a completely separate uh, you know, series on. Uh, the CRE outbreaks that occurred in 2015 were something of an eye opener across the industry. I mean, there had been uh, superbug outbreaks and. To be technically correct, you know, outbreaks of multi-drug resistant organisms. Uh, but in 2015, you had um, close to a dozen facilities across the country that experienced these outbreaks, and uh, a great many patients were in, infected by scopes that carried these organisms. A great many patients died. And the key thing that a lot of people don't understand about the 2015 outbreaks is that when FDA and other investigators looked into them, people were doing things correctly. You know, they were reprocessing according to the IFUs, the equipment was working, people were following instruction. You know, you, you couldn't blame this on operator error. Uh, they were using high level disinfection and the bugs were surviving. And that's when FDA scrambled and released their four supplemental measures. One of these supplemental measures was the use of ethylene oxide sterilization. And a lot of people at that point had, you know, had kind of conveniently forgotten about it. Very significantly, in 2015, every healthcare facility experiencing an outbreak that began gas sterilizing their scopes brought the outbreak to a finish, or they, they ended the outbreak. Gas sterilization was the thing that consistently you know, ended the outbreak in these facilities where it was happening. And I think that created a lot of reconsideration of ethylene oxide as a technology. Uh, subsequently, FDA in 2016-2017 began looking at these four supplemental measures, and they, they were requiring field surveillance of, okay, we, we required these measures, what's working? You know, how did they work out? And one of the four supplemental measures was uh, multiple HLD cycles, multiple cycles through washer disinfectors. And 
one of the things that the field surveillance showed was that multiple cycles of high-level disinfection uh, did not work. It did not consistently get rid of these organisms. The field surveillance indicated that ethylene oxide of the four methods was the most consistently successful. The FDA conducted uh, validation studies. These are laboratory tests. And the laboratory tests of the four methods showed that ethylene oxide was the only method of the four that consistently resulted in complete microbial inactivation, i.e., got rid of the, the superbugs. And this is very powerful data. And it really, to our way of thinking, it's, it's changed the nature of the debate. And we'll get more into that, but um, this was a game changer. And obviously, the, the 2015 outbreaks uh, had to do with duodenoscopes. And there were a lot of people that said, well, that's it's kind of a specialty scope. This is not a big deal. Well, in 2017, you began to have similar outbreaks with bronchoscopes. And recently, in the last year, you've began to have similar outbreaks with urethroscopes. And FDA has come back and with these, these other scope types said, well, you, you should really use one of the four uh, supplemental measures with these scopes too. And so this problem is, is not going away. If anything, it is expanding. And I think this is changing the nature of the conversation that we're having. Yeah, uh, because bacteria evolves. And so um, its its whole goal is to continue to thrive and be able to meet the challenge of the conditions or the environmental conditions. And when we're trying to achieve kill is to survive that. And they get stronger as a result of that process. And that's why it's not going away. And I don't want to steer away from this, but I do want to talk a little bit about chemical monitoring because I feel like this conversation always comes in sort of parallel um, when we're talking about gas sterilization especially, but I think it's an even broader conversation than that. But what is your thoughts on the role that chemical monitoring should play in gas sterilization? And, and if you want to say all forms of sterilization, by all means, take it there as well. Okay, so uh, frankly, I don't want to waste a lot of time on this one because to me, uh, the situation is very clear. Uh, hospitals, healthcare facilities have a responsibility to protect their employees from known hazards. You know, this is captured in OSHA, uh, the general clause, I believe it's 51A you have a responsibility to monitor and protect employees from known hazards. And anyone who tells you that, well, we, we don't have to test for hydrogen peroxide, we don't have to test for parasitic acid, uh, it's simply wrong. You are opening, opening yourself to liability, you're opening yourself to uh, OSHA complaints, OSHA citations. Uh, both of the major hydrogen peroxide manufacturers have released studies showing that the other guy's system can release unsafe levels of hydrogen peroxide into the workplace. This is, this is the hydrogen peroxide manufacturers. The data on parasitic acid is even more dramatic. And so, you know, the, the answer to this is just no. Um, you must monitor, you must protect your employees. And we've known this in the ethylene oxide field for, you know, going on 50 years. Uh, everyone else that's using alternate methods of chemical sterilization must monitor. I mean, let's be honest, any chemical that is an effective antimicrobial is going to be dangerous, period, full stop. You know, any chemical sterilant is something that you're going to have to test for. And I, I really just don't see that this is a, a subject of debate at this point. Hmm. It's about managing potential exposure, and that's yeah. really what it, yeah, I totally and, and get just, that. 
pr protecting employees from known hazards. Yeah, known hazards that don't necessarily present themselves right then and there in the moment, but over time. So, uh, Ted, let's let's uh, you you said I have a, a knack for uh, opening Pandora's box, baby. <laughs> but uh, and we're going to get into a Q&A session here in just a little bit. I've got a couple of questions for you left before we do that. But this one really is kind of an open ended one. But what are some of the myths that still remain prevalent in the industry today around gas sterilization. And I think you've alluded to a couple, but I want to spell them right out um, and bring them in. And, and partly because I think that those myths will tee up a lot of questions from the audience today. Okay, well, uh, there's some that, uh, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on. The idea that ethylene oxide is an old technology, uh, simply not true. Uh, toxicity, you hear a lot of people talking about the fact that ethylene oxide is more dangerous than other chemical sterilants. Uh, do your homework. Go to the OSHA website. Go to the NIOSH website. You will see that the comparative toxicity of ethylene oxide to hydrogen peroxide or parasitic acid, it's all pretty much the same when you get into the, the personal exposure levels. However, when you get into the IDLH, the immediate danger to life and health, the data is very interesting. Ethylene oxide actually has a higher level than hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid, meaning that in terms of the IDLH, ethylene oxide is relatively safer. Now, I'm just a guy on the internet. Don't take my word for it. Um, <laughs> I'm challenging everybody that, you know, is still confused about this, do your homework. Go to the OSHA website, go to the NIOSH website, and, you know, you will see again, any chemical sterilant is something that you need to be careful with. And ethylene oxide is not unique in terms of its risks. Uh, there's a myth that I want to address, and this is, it's not fair to call it a myth. I, I, I'd prefer to say it's a... Um, Misconception? A, a contentious subject. Mm. Um, and that is, you know, the, the subject of, of endoscopes and the idea that high-level disinfection is good enough. And when I began in this field about 23 years ago, and people talked about the reprocessing of endoscopes, and they talked about disinfection versus sterilization, the refrain was, well, you know, these scopes are not going into sterile parts of the body. So why, you know, why sterilize them? They're not going into a, a sterile body cavity for the most part, or they are traversing a non-sterile part of the body. And this is the refrain that we've heard literally for decades. The challenge is that I'm not worried about the, the bugs in my body. I'm worried about the, uh, the bugs in the, uh, the guy before me whose bugs may have survived reprocessing. And this is no longer a hypothetical concern. I think the outbreaks of, of 2015, 2017, and you know, those within the last year have shown that this is a, a big issue. It is a growing issue. It is a known issue. And it's an issue that at the, the national level, at, when you go to these conferences, the debate is becoming quite heated. You know, you've got researchers who are saying, you know, look, we are finding these organisms every place we look. And you've got a growing chorus of national infection control experts who are saying, we really need to sterilize, you know, all scopes at this point. Now, on the other end, you've got, you know, hospital representatives who are saying, you know, look, Sterilization takes longer, it's going to cost more, we can't do it. 
And that's the nature of the debate right now is, you know, the, the researchers who see the growing threat and hospitals who, you know, are faced with the challenge of the logistics of trying to sterilize all of their instruments. And, you know, this is um, a debate that we're going to hear more about. And I, I bring this up in the myths section because I really feel that um, this idea that high-level disinfection is good enough, uh, it's no longer something that we can take for granted. It's something that you know, individual healthcare facilities are starting to reconsider on their own. Yeah, and there's just been some um, updates in the industry from the experts, as you said, kind of pointing in that direction as well. Um, you've done a really nice job with your analogy of telling us where we've been with gas sterilization and where we stand today, but I'm going to challenge you to exercise a little bit more of that ability of yours to paint this picture. And I'm going to ask you to be a little hypothetical in, in some respects too. I want you to paint a picture of the future for us you know, and specifically in regards to gas sterilization, but I think it's very connected to the conversation that we were just having a, a moment ago. But what do you see if you were to look into your crystal ball or you know, put on some, some glasses that can help you see into the future? What do you think is gonna be coming up maybe in the next five to 10 years? Okay, well, uh, uh, thank you. My, my crystal ball is not particularly good, but I think there are certain things that we can say uh, with certainty. <clears throat> and number one, uh, I get the question periodically about, um, you know, okay, ethylene oxide. You're saying that we should, you know, replace all of our sterilizers with ethylene oxide. And, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago, you would walk into SPDs and they would have a bank of autoclaves and a bank of ethylene oxide sterilizers. And, you know, those days are gone. You know, today, the modern SPD is going to have a range of technologies available to them. You know, there is a, a very powerful role for hydrogen peroxide. It's, it's a very fast method. There is a role for the, uh, the parasitic acid washers. You know, autoclaves are not going away. And, you know, that said, I think that ethylene oxide is, is going to have a role also. The modern SPD is going to be faced with a, a wide range of challenges, a wide range of pressures, and they need to have a lot of tools. Uh, to strain a metaphor, we'll, uh, we sometimes talk about sterilization like golf. You know, you don't go out, you know, on the golf course saying, well, you know, what's the best club? I'm going to bring my, my best club out and play <laughs> golf. You know, you go out and you know, you've got an entire bag full of clubs and you, you take out the club that is appropriate to, you know, where you are on the golf course. And I think this metaphor works well for sterilization, that the SPDs of the future are going to have a range of tools available to them and they will use the best tool available for the challenge that they are facing at that point. Uh, as you said, the challenge of multidrug resistant organisms is not going away. And the latest data is not only concerning, it's scary. Uh, you know, these, these bugs increasingly are resistant to the antibiotics of last resort, which means you catch one of these and there is nothing that the hospital can do. I mean, this is this is really concerning the people that study this at a high level. And as the endoscope debate continues, I have a question for people in SPDs. I have a question for infection control professionals. And it's a very personal question. And that is that if an instrument, an endoscope, is going to be used on your mother. It's going to be used on a family member. Which would you prefer? A sterile scope 
or one that's been high-level disinfected? And if you answer that question honestly, you get a sense of the direction that the industry is headed in. And I think that's something that is going to resonate over the next couple of years. And if that question doesn't resonate, I hate to say it, but some of the lawsuits that are developing from some of these infections are also going to drive this process. The modern ethylene oxide sterilizer is a small tabletop system. It's got a small footprint. It's easy to install. It's easy to operate. There is no excuse that the modern SPD does not have this essential tool in their department for those most critical scopes and for their most vulnerable patients. And Justin, that's, that's something that I'm passionate about, and I believe that's one of the directions that the industry is headed in. It's a really important message, right, is doing everything that we can, you know, and not trying to, uh, say, putt for birdie with a driver instead of a putter. And I, I want to kind of just tie this to one last thing. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this to the table as well because you said my crystal ball isn't always that good but the truth is you know that you're seeing the data what you just described is some things that are happening now that give us some clues to what we might see in the future and i know that that really is what drives innovation there's a sense of we have to anticipate and so what in a what is what innovations or what what is the focus of innovation today based on that anticipation of where we're headed? Wow. Uh, that's, that's a great question. That's, you know, that, that's another subject for a, a future <laughs> podcast. Uh, one of the Amy committees that I belong to is uh, alternate sterilization technologies. And there are a lot of very bright people working on you know, some very innovative, potentially disruptive technologies uh, that are in the pipeline. And not all of these are going to work out. You know, a lot of them are in the trial phase right now. Uh, everybody understands that this superbug issue is not going away. Uh, it's hard to say you know, which of these technologies is going to work out. From what I've seen, uh, there are a number that have promise. They'll be coming online in the next couple of years. I'll say this as a manufacturer of a modern ethylene oxide system. Uh, none of them has the track record and the proven reliability of ethylene oxide. None of them have the the full range of compatibility with different materials that ethylene oxide has. And to a certain extent, uh, none of them have the track record of mitigating potential risk. And again, ethylene oxide has been around for 50, 60 years. Uh, we know how to protect employees. We know how to reduce emissions to the environment. And so I'd say that, you know, again, there's some uh, very, very interesting alternates that are going to be coming online. They're going to have to go through their own teething process in terms of, you know, safety testing, efficacy testing, and you know, these things don't happen quickly. All right, Ted. Well, this was a great interview, and I appreciate your honest and candid responses to the questions too. I never feel like you're holding anything back. And I think that's really, I think that's really important. And, um, I do have one other surprise for you before we, Roll before off. we go and, and get into the question and answer period. Uh, you might remember when we were down, uh, to tour the facility for beyond the tour that you probably thought I didn't have this anymore, but we were given, <laughs> some some lab coats uh for that very first episode 
of Beyond the Tour. And you can kind of see that right here, Beyond the Tour. Very nice. Uh, Very nice. And I just wanted to let you know, this wasn't something that, you know, I've still got the uh, the plaque that you <laughs> gave us too. And uh, I want you to know I didn't take that lightly. Uh, you took a, a deep dive with us to really, you know, again, like I just said, you're very, you don't leave anything, you know, kind of hidden. You're very open and straightforward. And I, I really felt that way when we got to tour your facilities and really understand the under Anderson culture while we were there. And you made us feel welcome and like we were one of the family. So I, I could not not put on my lab coat as we're wrapping up this interview on the expert well, series conference. Nicely done. You know, I've, I've got to thank you. I've got to thank you for that because, uh, as we've, dis as we've discussed, um, Anderson is an American manufacturer. We, we produce everything that we sell here at our North Carolina headquarters. And We've got a lot of employees that uh, labor in the shadows in the sense that they don't get a lot of recognition. And what your team did by coming to our facility and you know, interviewing people and, and allowing them to tell their stories uh, was really wonderful. I, I, people still talk about that here around our facility, and you know, they, still, they still give each other grief. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, thank you for that. And thank you for, you know, shedding light on a part of the industry that doesn't get enough recognition, the people in Central Sterile, the people who are building the equipment, the tools, you know, that make uh, the sterilization of devices possible. So again, I think you guys are doing great work and we got to have you back. Yeah, uh, I can't wait. It'll definitely uh, be long overdue. And I can just tell you, uh, you know, you're giving us a lot of credit for um, helping gain momentum for the industry uh, to continue striving forward. But it's partnerships like this one and your willingness to do something different, like beyond the tour, that really help open that up and uh and gain uh, increasing momentum over time so i know we've got a little bit of time left i want to leave some room for question and answers and so uh, i think we're going to get right into that here in just a minute fantastic justin thank you very much thank you ted